Make sure you guys hit the subscribe button if you guys are enjoying the content that we're throwing up. And uh, make sure you guys hit the like button if you enjoy the video. And yeah, let's begin. Okay, so we are getting back into the thick of things with Secret Wars Part 2. Okay, so this is when things get kind of cool. This is one of the reasons why Secret Wars was so awesome. It was one of these landmark stories that came out for a bunch of different reasons. One of the big reasons is because it answers questions like, if Spider-Man fought this character, who would win, right? And it would more often than not be Spider-Man, unless you're talking about a telepath or a reality warper, and we'll see why in this video. Uh, but then it's also things like Iron Man's armor, right? For those of you guys who were kind of curious, at what point did Tony Stark go from a guy who just flew around in an Iron Man suit as a Golden Avenger to become coming the guy who started experimenting with all these different armor types, this answers that as well. So a lot of things came out of Secret Wars, right? It's one of the reasons why this story is so important when it comes to the history of Marvel Comics. Uh, and so what this does is it initially picks up with, uh, with, with Magneto, right? Now, if you guys recall in the last video, Magneto uh, had kind of toyed with the idea of allying himself, with the, uh, allying himself with the Avengers. But the idea was that while Magneto was essentially reforming and was on the road to becoming a good guy, which would ultimately come to fruition in Uncanny X-Men number 200, at the moment, he was still seen as a bad guy by the various heroes who were there. And so they immediately kind of started asking the question, is he a good guy? Is he a bad guy? And the kind of infighting that resulted left Magneto with really no other desire than to just leave everybody behind, right? So he ended up discovering his own personal citadel that he was using as a base of operations. Now, eventually he ended up in a second conflict with the superheroes. And when that happened, he basically collapsed part of the superheroes citadel onto itself and then kidnapped Janet Van Dyne the Wasp. And we didn't really know the reason for that. But what this does is it comes to fruition when he basically frees Janet Van Dyne and and then of course she kind of pokes around the place for a little bit and then ultimately discovers Magneto. A small little bit of a skirmish ensues insofar as she basically shows, look, you know, I've got my wasp bite. I don't really need to attack you physically. But ultimately Magneto bringing her here is done for the purpose of basically talking to her and trying to find a way to communicate and sort of create an alliance of sorts with the Avengers, right? Or at least that seems to be the case. And the reason why was because right off the bat in that first skirmish, Magneto basically realized these folks aren't gonna listen to reason, right? They're hell bent on the idea that I'm a bad guy. What I'm going to need is one of them to vouch for me. And with Janet Van Dyne being the leader of the Avengers, albeit Captain America kind of being the field commander at the moment, what better person to do that than Janet Van Dyne? Now, I don't know if kidnapping her is the best way to sort of initiate that conversation, uh, but it's one of these things where he does have his own motivation. We'll find out what that is, you know, as we progress further, but at the very least, to kind of seem to initiate a, a sort of truce between himself and the Avengers. Now, following that, what you get is this scenario where the heroes are kind of piecemealing things back together, right? Basically taking these portions of their, uh, of their base of operations, kind of bringing it back together together and, and getting things back in their place and so on and so forth. Just kind of a rebuilding phase, right? Spider-Man is really kind of the main focal point for this little bit of the story. And the reason why is he's kind of making his way through and Peter Parker, you know, with all the intellect that he has is really doing what a lot of other people don't seem to be doing. Spider-Man's investigating the area, right? He's kind of like looking around and seeing what's going on. Like, you know, what's up with this whole base of operations, you know, these citadels that the villains have and the ones that we have, and presumably the one that Magneto has seem to kind of cater to our every need. So like, let's see how far this goes. Now, this will become a huge focal point once you get further into the Secret Wars story, and then you get Spider-Man Black. But until that point, Peter Parker's just kind of poking around. Now, ultimately, this leads him to coming across the X-Men. And in this moment, what he basically overhears the X-Men talking about is essentially leaving the Avengers. Now, again, this is one of the cool things about it, and it's one of one of the reasons why Jim Shooter writing was so cool, is because you get some infighting here, right? Not in the, in the sense of a physical altercation, but in the sense of not everybody's on the same page, right? And rightfully so. That's one of the things about the X-Men. They've never really been on the same page as everybody else. The Avengers protect the world from various threats and the X-Men deal with the whole mutant threat and, and humanity and so on and so forth, but no one's ever really been on the on, on the side of the X-Men, right? That's one of the reasons why Avengers versus X-Men was such a big story is because up until that point, you would see instances where like the X-Men and the Fantastic Four or like the X-Men and the Avengers would team up or something like that, but it wasn't very often that you heard of like the right or the friends of humanity or Apocalypse or some villain like that popping up and then potentially destroying the X-Men and then like the Avengers coming to their aid or the Fantastic Four coming to their aid. You never really saw that all that often. So in a lot of ways, the X-Men kind of adopted this philosophy that we're our own island, right? And which is why you kind of see the X-Men comics right now with Jonathan Hickman taking on the form that they are. They were always just kind of out there and isolated in the world. And that's sort of how, the, that's sort of the approach they're taking now. The issue is, you know, when they start saying things like, well, let's go to Magneto and let's ally with him, let's form an alliance. This immediately convinces Spider-Man that the X-Men are essentially working against the superheroes. Now, this is one of the most important parts of the story. And the reason why is because we've seen Spider-Man face off against various characters over the course of time in, in Marvel comics. 
comics. But the, the one of the questions that people ask all the time is, if Spider-Man fought Wolverine, who would win? If Spider-Man fought Colossus, who would win? You know, who would win in these different scenarios? What we get here is Spider-Man facing off against all the X-Men, and he beats them all. And the reason why is because of the one thing Spider-Man has that nobody else has, and that's his spider sense. Spider-Man's spider sense doesn't really say, like, Wolverine's getting ready to attack you right now. Instead, it just says, like, you're about to be attacked. But what it does is it always keeps him on guard, and it gives him a bit of an edge. It's like Goku from Dragon Ball Super with his Ultra Plot Armor, right? The idea that it basically keeps you a step ahead of everybody else, so you never really seem to have to worry about being defeated. Now, for Spider-Man, his spider sense does keep him aware in terms of people jumping into physical altercations, different things like that. So the reason why this benefits him is because while it is more of a defensive maneuver, right? It basically allows him to get out of harm's way. You can't hit what you can't touch. And that's basically why Spider-Man is so capable here. So if you notice this, between his agility, his webbing, like his intellect, the whole nine yards, he takes out Rogue, he takes out Colossus, he takes out Wolverine. He, he basically is able to dodge Storm. He takes out Nightcrawler, but he takes out the entirety of the X-Men. Like none of them are really able to even lay a hand on him. He's that capable. And it's one of the reasons, if you go talk to Sal over a comic pop, it's one of the reasons why he'll be like, yeah, man, Spider-Man is like probably one of the most capable superheroes out there in a variety of ways. Now, if it comes to someone like the Molecule Man, Owen Reese, sure, he'll turn, he'll turn, he'll disperse Spider-Man's atoms across the cosmos. So Spider-Man's not gonna have much of a chance there. And one of the other things that really comes out of this is how would Spider-Man fare against someone like Charles Xavier? And where Xavier seems to be kind of out of commission for the moment, insofar as Spider-Man immediately punches him, it's the smart move to make because Xavier's the only real credible threat there, right? Because his power is a mental power and Spider-Man can't dodge, you know, he can't bob and weave telepathic attacks. And that's really kind of the answer to that question. How would Spider-Man fare against a telepath? He wouldn't do very well at all. And the reason why is because once he gets away from the X-Men, he gets back out into the hallway and he comes across Reed Richards. Xavier had used his powers to wipe Spider-Man's mind of any indication that the X-Men were working to go basically ally themselves with Magneto. Now, Xavier's not too happy that he had to do that, but he did it because it was the only real choice they made. And so grabbing one of the vessels, which only really seems to allow it to be flown based on thought. And then of course, Xavier basically taking the X-Men out into this maelstrom, out into this massive storm in turn leads us over to Magneto and to uh, and uh, to Dr. Doom. Now, Magneto kind of starts putting the moves on Janet Van Dyne a little bit, right? Just kind of being like, hey, look, like, like you know, like, you know, girl, like, you know I'm hot. <laughs> like, you know that, that's like, he's putting the moves, putting the moves out, right? I mean, it, it's kind of interesting, but it's one of these things where basically Dr. Doom was trying to bring on uh, Magneto as an ally. Now, of course, Magneto immediately turns him down. And when you leave Magneto and Janet Van Dyne and you switch over to, uh, to Dr. Doom, Dr. Doom kind of laments this, right? Because the power of Magneto and the power to control the entire electromagnetic spectrum is no small thing. And this and other moments like this are kind of really pointing to this idea that Magneto really is just that damn powerful. But what we end up doing is we basically end up following Dr. Doom to where he approaches two characters. The first is Marsha Rosenberg and the second one is Mary McFerrin. Now, those of you guys who are reading Immortal Hulk right now and you have Titania, this is how she gets her start, right? This is Mary McFerrin, the blonde one who's human looking. Marsha Rosenberg, she ends up changing her name to Volcana, right? And, and the way this is played out, it was kind of a tie-in, but not really. It took place in She-Hulk issue number 10. The way this worked out is that Mary and uh, and Marsha both lived in Denver, right? And around that time, that's when you started to see the rise of, of Spider-Woman, right? I think it was Julia Carpenter, the original Spider-Woman, although it may have been Jessica Drew. I don't think it was Jessica Drew. I don't think she was that early, but I could be wrong there. But regardless, uh, when you ended up seeing Spider-Woman kind of making a name for herself in Denver, uh, Denver, Colorado, this led to uh, both Marsha and Mary kind of poking around and seeing what was going on. Now, while they were largely social outcasts, when everything took place at the beginning of Secret Wars, one portion of Battle World is composed of Denver, Colorado. And so when the Beyonder took that part of the United States, yanked it out, and then brought it and, and, and used it to form part of Battle World, they came along with it, right? So during the She-Hulk tie-in, that's when you're introduced to their characters. They're not overly important. It wouldn't really be until after this story they become important, especially Volcana and her relationship with Owen Reese, the Molecule Man. But it's one of these things where Titania is like, you know, where, where she was kind of small and scrawny, came from a poor background. The abilities Dr. Doom used to modify her and to give her powers basically made her a larger woman, made her a more voluptuous woman, but also gave her like super strength, durability, different things like that. And so, you know, following that, they're basically brought in by Dr. Doom to become allies alongside everybody else. Now, one of the things that you get right off the bat is kind of Titania looking to pick a fight with Crusher Creel, the Absorbing Man. This is where that relationship starts. For those of you guys who are reading Immortal Hulk right now, this is where that relationship kicks off, where the two of them really kind of kind of form an on-again, off-again relationship. It's really kind of the definition of an unhealthy relationship, <laughs> where they're constantly breaking up and constantly getting back together again. But that's more or less where it kind of kicks off. For the Molecule Man, his love interest really starts to take form in Marsha, right? And the reason why is because where Marsha had heard of the Molecule Man, it's kind of this legendary guy with this incredible power that he never really seemed to use to its full potential. She always saw him as more of like an imposing guy, right? The kind of like this really maybe arrogant or very, very haughty guy. Instead, when she meets him, he's a lot more sensitive than she initially thought he would be. And that's kind of a cool little moment there. And because what it does is it lays the groundwork for the 
relationship between the two of them, which would actually go on for, for more than a little while in Marvel Comics. Uh, but what ends up happening here is you kind of pick up with the next morning. Basically, Captain America wakes up, realizing it's sunrise. He gets pissed at the Incredible Hulk for not telling him, hey, the, hey, the, like, the storm basically cleared up because this is the time when the villains would attack. And they do. The villains basically launch their attack against all the superheroes. And for the most part, with the combined help of Titania and Volcana, along with Ultron, who's basically been brought back, they get the upper hand quick, fast, and in a hurry, right? I mean, they take these guys out super fast. And it's kind of nuts, right? It's, 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 it's kind of bonkers because immediately the heroes are kind of caught unawares. And so as a result of that, with the heroes basically fleeing for their lives for the most part, what you end up getting is one probably one of the more iconic moments of the story. And the reason why I say this is because you've, you've kind of got, you know, Dr. Octopus using some, some binoculars basically that he found within the Citadel and looking for the heroes and ultimately finds them about five miles out trying to regroup their forces and trying to get to a new Citadel or someplace they can basically hide and then heal themselves if they can and then jump back into the fray again. But with that being the case, the Molecule Man looking to show off to uh, Volcana a little bit basically says, well, I mean, I can stop him right there. So what he ends up doing is lifting up an entire mountain range, like a colossal mountain range, and then pushing it over on top of the heroes and then dropping it down. And it's kind of nuts, right? It's kind of bonkers because during this time, one of the reasons why you don't see Thor here is because Thor had previously gone to uh, gone to Amora the Enchantress and then basically said, let's leave here and let's talk about what we would do as gods, right? They kind of go out and form their own alliance. You've got the Avengers who are maintaining their alliance. You've got the X-Men who go and form their own alliance, presumably alongside Magneto. And then you've got Doctor Doom leading all the villains, right? So everybody's splitting up. All these factions are being created. So it's one of these things where everything really kind of seems to be seems to be going to pot to a degree. Now, in the midst of all this, ultimately you end up having Amora, who basically, you know, with the, the this giant mountain range crashing down, of course, it sends shockwaves throughout the entire planet. Amora grabs Thor. They end up taking off, arriving right in front of the in front of the villains. And then ultimately, uh, Doctor Doom basically uses Ultron. Now, of course, Amora kind of re-allies herself with the villains. And then Ultron basically uses a disintegration ray, as it was seen. And then ultimately just destroys, or at least seems to destroy Thor, right? Like completely and totally disintegrate Thor, which at the time was kind of mind-boggling, right? I mean, really for me, the only way to really to know whether or not this was mind-boggling is to go back and read the old letters pages. But if you go back and you read the letters pages for these stories, oh, it was crazy. People were blown away. They were just like, there's no way Thor was just killed by Ultron. Like that's kind of nuts. You know, it was a little bonkers to see it all go down, right? That's one of the reasons why letters pages are a really good resource for seeing how people were responding to comics back in the day before you had forums, different things like that. But it was kind of a crazy thing because what ends up happening is the X-Men basically arrive to Magneto's Citadel. And it's kind of funny because as soon as they get there, uh, Janet Van Dyne turns on Magneto because what he does is he tells Charles Xavier basically what his plan is. And what he says here is if Dr. Doom basically slayed all the heroes, Dr. Doom would get his wish, right? His wish would be whatever his selfish desire happens to be, which would likely be Dr. Doom saying, I desire absolute power over the universe. And that would be it. You know, with regards to the Avengers, who knows what the Avengers would do? And Magneto doesn't really trust the Avengers because they're humans. Even though they're, they're, they have superpowers, they're not mutants. And so he doesn't really trust them all too much. At the same time, what he tells Xavier is if we had that, if we slayed and we killed all the villains, then what we could do is we could wish for a paradise across the universe, right? Where like all mutants and all humans live in a peaceful coexistence with each other. Now, it's kind of an interesting scenario because on one side, you could look at that and you could say, that's a good idea, right? Because Xavier's plan hasn't worked. Xavier's idea of a peaceful coexistence between humans and mutants just never really seemed to work. And that's what you see playing out in Jonathan Hickman's X-Men right now, right? Magne or I'm sorry, Xavier's like, look, I tried the peaceful route with you guys. You didn't want to play ball. So what we're going to do is we're going to form our own nation and then we're going to conquer yours as time goes on, right? We're going to basically take out, take over your infrastructure. I, I believe in you as people, but I don't believe in my dream anymore. That's, that's really kind of the message that he's been conveying over the course of, of Hickman's X-Men run, right? So the, the dream just never really seemed to work out. So if that was never really the case, if it never really seemed to work, then go for a better option. Now, ultimately it does take away the wills of people, but if the wills of people would have led to like a war between humans and mutants across the world, then just using some kind of utilitarian stance, it's the best decision to make, right? Because what you get is better than what you lose. And so it's one of these, these cool things, right? It's one of these, these cool little debates and, and philosophical arguments that goes on with these various things. Now, what you end up doing from here is you basically end up switching over, of course, where Janet Van Dyne goes back into her wasp form. And then in turn, the various other X-Men, you know, try to stop her from going back to the Avengers and basically saying, here's everything that's gone down. Wasp manages to overtake the X-Men and then in turn, basically bail out to where the Avengers are located at. And so what you end up doing is you switch over directly to the Incredible Hulk. And this again is one of the most iconic moments of Secret Wars when the Incredible Hulk is holding a mountaintop up right now. At this point in time, this had never been seen before. We had never seen an instance of the Incredible Hulk displaying strength like this. And that was the intention of Jim Shooter, right? Pull out all the stops. Take these grandiose displays of each individual character, right? So Spider-Man is a character who's very, very capable. Let's show how capable he is by basically defeating all of the X-Men. The Incredible Hulk is super strong. Let's show how super strong he is by have him holding up a mountaintop. That's the kind of thing that Jim Shooter would 
Lawrence was going for when he was writing Secret Wars. And that's why you see things like this. And so what ends up happening here is because of the fact that the Incredible Hulk is tiring, right? It's not something he could do forever. He couldn't really sit there like for years and hold this mountaintop up. <laughs> You know, even the Incredible Hulk, despite all of his strength, does have a limit to a degree. This is compounded by the fact that this is during the era when you've got basically the Incredible Hulk's strength and Bruce Banner's mind, right? So with that in mind, there are some limits here. It's not infinite. It's not really infinite insofar as the Incredible Hulk's not angry, right? The Incredible Hulk's strength rises with his anger. At this point, he's just kind of like, I really hope we don't die. Like, that's basically it. <laughs> but, but nonetheless, what they end up doing is basically waking up Reed Richards, you know, after he had basically, you know, passed out or been knocked out. And then in turn, he starts like MacGyvering everything, right? Like, he basically ends up taking like some of Iron Man's armor tapping into it or the web shooters of spider-man the arrows of hawkeye it's just straight up macgyver and it's just like give me these small little things right i need like a rubber band a piece of gum and a toothpick and by god we'll get out of here folks <laughs> That's kind of what it turns out to be. But what he does is he basically uses these various things and then manages to channel these various forms of energy through Iron Man's armor, which going with a full repulsor blows a hole in a mountainside. Now, this is why this matters is because after this story going forward, where you saw Iron Man sort of experimenting with these small little armor types here and there, this would push everything into a whole new level. And in fact, it's because of this realization of what his armor is capable of, what it can truly do if he puts it to the test and expands on it, that three years after Secret Wars in 1987, Bob Layton wrote Stark Wars or Armor Wars as it's more popularly known. But again, it's, it's one of these cool little things where it's like Secret Wars spun out a whole bunch of new stuff from Marvel Comics, which is a pretty big deal, right? That's why it's such a significant story. But following this, the heroes basically need, need a new base of operations, right? They need a place to go to in order to remarshal their forces, get their stuff together and get back into it again. And so what you end up getting is Spectrum, Monica Rambeau, heading out, kind of traveling around, looking for, for some place where they can rest and recuperate and then ultimately discovering a small little village. Now, this village has like some people in it and we can largely assume this village Village is one of many places that was ripped out from the universe and basically brought to form battle world right so it's just some planet somewhere where they don't really speak english but they do have the ability to heal and so they basically start healing uh healing johnny storm along with a few other people but then ben Grimm suddenly snaps back into going back into his thing form right so he's no longer human anymore this will be explained as we get further into it but it is kind of a cool little thing but the big takeaway from all this is what you end up getting is where galactus is kind of standing on this hillside that does overlook this village that what ends up going on is reed richards is just kind of kind of musing and kind of looking around and saying, okay, it's a little weird that Galactus is, is here, but I don't really know why he's here, but I do understand why he, you know, him feeling as lonely as he does, right? The fact that he's just kind of out here by himself in the same way that Reed is out here by himself in a lot of different ways. Well, then suddenly Galactus moves and puts his hands in the air and Reed Richards immediately understands what this means because what this does mean is that Galactus is now beginning the process of putting his machinery together. Galactus is going to start consuming the battle world. He's going to start consuming that entire planet. It's kind of nuts. But with that being said, guys, we're going to bring this video to an end. If you are new here to Comics Explained, make sure you guys hit the sub button to become part of the Rob Corps. If you guys enjoyed this video, make sure you drop a like, and I will catch you all later. Peace.